Welcome to Mushroom Wonderland. You can definitely do swaps. 
Can you hybridize anything within um, each section of psilocybe? No, you can't hybridize anything within psilocybe, but you can definitely hybridize psilocybes. In general, the rule is what you should do is sequence the two parents, and if they are 99% similar in the ITF gene or closer, then they will generally pair. So like psilocybe cubensis pairs really well with psilocybe natalensis, psilocybe juxtagenensis, psilocybe pseudorastacorn, and psilocybe indica. So those four, they all have slightly different DNA sequences, but they're all within 1% of each other, and they all hybridize just fine. Like something like psilocybe ovoidiosis tibiata is close to cubensis, but a little bit off to the side, and that will not cross with cubensis, at least not without something like protoplast fusion, so the more advanced techniques. But um, Hopi and Cyanessence, you could make a hybrid. No one's tried that one. The spores of Hopi are very elusive. Very few people have found that one. Um, but I think like Semilanciata and Baocystis would be good to try because they look way different, but they're actually really genetically close. Hmm. And then this one is one that's been mysterious for a long time. It's called Galeropsis polyturcoides. And it's this little succatory thing that never opens up. It was discovered in 1937 in Mount Shasta. Uh, but I found it a couple of years ago and I sequenced the DNA and it turns out it's actually a psilocybe really close to Pelliculosa. So a lot of these psilocybes grow up at a really high elevation and just never open up. And then uh, my friend Scott Postuni discovered this one in Florida. And this one, it looks a lot like Ogodio cystidiana, but it's much lighter in color. And uh, when he sequenced the DNA, it turns out that the DNA was quite a bit different, but still in that Ovodio cystidiata cubensis complex. So we decided we're going to call this one Psilocybe nivio tropicalis, just because it really likes tropical places and it's kind of white in color. It's really closely related to some like Psilocybe wave that demands us that are in India. A lot of good mushrooms in India. Uh, this one is really cool because this one was discovered in like the 1930s. But nobody knew it had psilocybin until somebody noticed a stained blue and they mailed me some. And I tried um, this test, and up there it is, the Miraculix test. So this is kind of cool because it's a reagent test, but it tells you the quantity of psilocybin and it's accurate to within about 10%. So this minosity is about 2% psilocybin, which is really strong. Uh, and there's actually a lot of really cool um, active minosities in North America, but um, this is like, none of, there's been no published active minosities in North America. So I just noticed a couple years ago that this one had psilocybin. And then last night, at like one in the morning, I was processing DNA sequences for my friend Kyle Cannon. And I discovered a second psilocybin psilocybin. And that one grows in New York. Um, I'll show you that stuff. Let me switch over here. Yep, so here we have iNaturalist. And so this is a really cool website that I'll talk more about. Um, but last night, um, my, so my friend Kyle Cannon, he has the Ohio DNA sequencing lab, and he will take mushrooms from anybody for free and sequence them with his nanopore sequencer, and then I was volunteering and helping him process the DNA sequence. So here is the DNA sequence here that I put in last night, and I noticed that there's a little bit of blue stain in this, uh, this mushroom, and that it's um, genetically, let's see, I have that over here, yeah, genetically, it's pretty close to Inosibi tricolor and some other ones that have psilocybin in them. So this is one from New York. And then I found another one that grows in Indiana. So there's like discovering new psilocybin mushrooms every day. Um, Will you but, repeat the name of uh, the organization you with? Okay, yeah. So that's the Ohio Mushroom DNA Lab. And uh, actually, the last slide in my talk, I give this URL out, and I'll talk about it a little bit more there. Um, and I'll also talk about the mycoblitz. So there's two ways to get free DNA barcoding in all the mushrooms you find. Um, it turns out that we don't really need more people sequencing mushrooms. What we need is more people collecting mushrooms. Because um, with the new technology, it costs the same amount of money to sequence one mushroom as it does 960 mushrooms. So we, if we all collect mushrooms and just like make, take good notes and good pictures and mail them all to Kyle Cannon, then he'll just run them all through his machine. And it's a lot faster for us to do that than for us all to do all the lab work in our kitchens. Um, anyway, this uh, psilocybin inasibi smells like cinnamon, so it's like a matsutake odor. Uh, but it's a little bit more pleasant. Oh, I'm not going to get so I can't just it. That's okay. A uh, little bit more pleasant. And then here's the other one. The other one grows in Indiana, right here in Lafayette, and also in New York. 
Um, but, yep, there's one in, another one in New York. So it's all these kind of like psilocybin mushrooms that people didn't realize were around. And when we discover these things, we give them code names. So the code name on this one is psilocybe IN116, which is, means that the 116th inocybe that we don't have a name for in Indiana. Um, and then the one I discovered last night, I gave it the code name uh, inocybe glaucescens, New York 01, because it was close to glaucescens. Uh, there's some new species from New York. Uh, anyway, these code names are really cool because we do not really have names for all these yet until they get validly published, but at least by having a code name we can communicate what we found and we can keep track of it and you can search iNaturalist or Mushroom Observer for these code names and you can pull up all of the records of these new species even before they're published. Would it be safe to eat those even when a lot of inosibes contain dangerous muscarin levels? Yeah, that's a really good question because a lot of inosibes are poisonous. Most of them are poisonous. But Brandon Matheny, who's a world, a world expert on anosophy, he did a study in 2014 where he tested hundreds of anosophies for psilocybin and for muscarin. And what he found is that like 70% are poisonous and then 29% are edible because they don't have muscarin and then 1% have psilocybin. And nothing that had muscarin also had psilocybin. So I think that's completely a coincidence. There's no like design that makes these uh, psilocybin mushrooms non-toxic. Mm. But if that pack of that holds up, which it probably will, because these these are all the same clade as the other known psilocybin inosophies, so they're not like from some completely different section of the genus, but kind of closely related. So yeah, I would eat them. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and then this this here. Um, this is a list of which psilocybin mushrooms grow in every state in every country in the world. And if anyone's ever looking for psilocybin, this is the best place to start. Um, and the reason is because I keep this really up to date. So I update this list like a couple times a month. I updated it last night when I discovered these new ones last night. And so you can just go to any state or any country. And whenever anybody is like, hey, I'm in Zimbabwe and I saw this psilocybin mushroom, I'll be like, oh, and I'll add it to the list. Um, and then I put links to the DNA sequences and photos, like as much evidence as I have. Um, but what you would do is you can just go and search on uh, Mushroom Observer and iNaturalist. So those are the citizen science mycology sites. But if we were to like go down to Washington, you can see all of the psilocybin mushrooms we have in Washington. You can see there's quite a lot. And then you can search for all of those on iNaturalist and Mushroom Observer and you'll see how common they are, what part of the state they fruit in, what time of year they fruit in, and even exact coordinates a lot of the time. Um, like when I found find psilocybin mushrooms, I always put them on iNaturalist with the exact coordinates, unless there's like 100 pounds of them, then I won't skewer it. But if there's just like one pound of mushrooms or less, I just put the exact coordinates on there because I think the more people find these psilocybin mushrooms, the more people have them and can spread them around. Um, and also like, um, it's just a, a nice thing to do. Uh, but you can see there's a lot of really cool species on here. And uh, we're gonna go through those in my talk. Uh, let's see, and then another new psilocybin containing Inasabi doesn't have a name yet, but uh, for now we're calling it Inasabi bohemica, and it was uh, discovered right here. And so, well it's actually been found in a lot of places. It grows from here all the way to Southern California. Uh, but here's the coordinates of one the place like out over by Coin Off uh, that was found. So if anyone wants those coordinates, let me know. I can tell you. But I would love to get a sample of this because I have to go to Canada tomorrow and I, I don't have time to go out there and get these. Uh, there's also more trippy mushrooms than just psilocybin mushrooms. There's a lot of mushrooms that glow in the dark. Uh, here's a paper that came out just a couple days ago with a whole bunch of new species from Mexico that glow in the dark. Uh, so those are really cool, and maybe next year I can come give a talk on that. And uh, here's Mushroom Observer. I'll just show you this really quick, because you can upload your photos to Mushroom Observer. And Mushroom Observer is awesome because you upload your pictures, and then people vote on what you have. But you can upload your high-resolution photos. So I upload the 45 megapixel photos, where I still come off my camera. And then anybody can download these and get like the high-resolution versions. And you can like see what, what psilocybe I'm finding. Like here's this nice subruginosa from New Zealand, and here's some new species from New Zealand, and Angulospora. A lot of good ones on here. And the Zapatacorn from Ecuador with two heads, some new species from Ecuador. 
Uh, a lot of cool stuff on here. Uh, and same thing with iNaturalist. You can search iNaturalist for a psilocybe or any genus that you like. Um, also, if you like my photography, I have them on this website called mycena.llc. So if you go to mycena.llc slash prints, you can purchase all of the photography. They're all printed out on metal. Um, very nice looking things. Lots of psilocybes and cordyceps and all sorts of stuff. Um, so inosities are beautiful under the microscope. You can see the spores are kind of like, uh, almost like star shaped. And then these cystidia, these are the chylocystidia on the gill edge. And they have uh, calcium oxalate crystals at the apices, so very beautiful. Um, there's dark field microscopy where you get the dark black ground. Turtles. And then somebody mailed me this tuberia. And tuberia is like a common inactive mushroom, but this one was staining blue. It came in the mail from Pennsylvania. And that's about 1%, so it's not as potent. But there are two barriers that contain psilocybin as well. Um, and then there's a lot of research that's done um, on psilocybin chemistry these days. And it's all done out of this very small city in Germany called Jena. And that's where the Hofmeister lab is. Um, so the people that work in this lab are really cool. There's like Dirk Hofmeister and Felix Bly and um, all these guys in their um, they're doing really cool, like really high-end uh, psilocybin chemistry work. So they discovered norcilocin is in all psilocybin mushrooms, and they've discovered that there's a dozen different tryptamines uh, in mushrooms. So those all probably have effects that contribute to the, uh, the different effects of the mushrooms. And different species of mushrooms, or even different strains, have different ratios of those tryptamines. But uh, mushrooms also have beta-carbolines. The beta-carbolines are what they put in ayahuasca to make the DMT orally active but they're actually in mushrooms too. So the fruits of Psilocybe cubensis have very little, but the mycelium of Psilocybe cubensis has uh, quite a bit, as do the Psilocybe tamponensis truffles. And the fruits of some of these exotic species, like Psilocybe zeponicorum, are pretty rich in beta-carbolines as well. And then just last week, a paper came out where they discovered that um, psilocybin mushrooms also have terpenes. And they've just discovered this, so we don't really know what they do, but I believe that the terpenes inhibit some of the effects. So the effect of the psilocybin mushroom is kind of like all of the tryptamines put together, plus all of the beta carbolines put together, minus the terpenes. Um, and so that's why you get so many different strains, different species, different effects from them. Um, but now I'll just go through all, all the different psilocybe that I know of from North America. Uh, this cerulipes grows out east. Uh, I find it in Mexico, but it grows on beach. Uh, in Mexico, it grows in habitats like this, have a really well decayed beach and birch wood. Um, another really cool one is Foliotina smithii. And this is one that grows around here. And this one's really interesting because it contains a lot of theocystin and arubinacin, which are these other tryptamines that are related to psilocybin but are not that close. Um, so if any, if any of these have like a different psychoactive effect, it's very likely the Foliotina smithii. Um, and there's like a certain psilocybin gene cluster that's in all psilocybin mushrooms, but the foliotina, uh, some psilocybin mushrooms, foliotina and inosibi, have a different gene cluster than we have in the rest of them. So um, these are much more likely to have different effects. Anyways, these have orange spores, so they look a lot like dead little deadly mushrooms, but you can tell because uh, they stain blue. But don't just eat random mushrooms, send me pictures first, and I'll tell you if they're poisonous. Um, these come up, like the further, the closer you get to Canada, the more common these are. But they're in Oregon, but they're even more common in Washington. They're like mossy and grassy areas. They look a lot like little gallerinas, but gallerinas don't have these longitudinal striations. I don't know if you can see it, probably can't see it in the screen, um, on the projector, but they have like vertical lines that gallerina never has. And then, um, they have the bluing at the stem base. Another really cool thing is that there's a lot of cuteas, the deer mushrooms, that contain psilocybin. And the most common one is cuteus americanus, um, which has been found uh, rarely on the west coast, but it's more common in the east. Uh, but two weeks ago, I was at the Georgia Mushroom Festival, and I taught a DNA barcoding class where people just brought in random mushrooms, and I DNA sequenced them. Uh, with a PCR machine and everything right in the class. And somebody brought in a blue staining cuteus from Georgia, 
I see for certain that turned out to be another new species. So, there's, yeah, new, new psilocybin mushrooms be dis being discovered every day, uh, way more than I can publish. Uh, but at least I can like put the DNA sequences in GenBank and just uh, maybe if I ever stop traveling, I will publish some of these. <laughs> Uh, Paleolus cinculus is super common, uh, especially in lawns and in gardens and in horse manure. Uh, so these, like you just find them in random lawns, the greener the better. But these have jet black spores and they have mottled gills. So if you just look at the gill surface here, you can see that there's like black patches and lighter colored patches and these things. Um, they are much more fragile than any psilocybe. So psilocybe are pretty stout mushrooms. You can almost tie a string in a knot but Paniolus are fragile like Sapphirella. Paniolus pimicola is another one that grows in lawns and contains psilocybin, um, jet black spores. Uh, in Washington, this is kind of rare, and what you have a lot of is Paniolus olivaceous. And I didn't get a time to uh, throw in olivaceous photos, but it's like this, but it has a darker olive colored cap. Really common in lawns around here. Uh, I found some when I was hanging out with Aaron last year. Hey. Gymnopilus luteofolius is really common um, here in Washington. It contains some psilocybin, not a whole lot. The last time I tried it, I ate nine grams dried, and I definitely saw colors, but I would eat 15 next time. <laughs> but it is beautiful. Um, well, I have new photos that I didn't put in here, but uh, they, they're some of the most beautiful psilocybin mushrooms because they start out bright purple, and then they have the bright orange spores. Uh, you cut them in half and they have some lavender tones on the inside. So they're, uh, they're really common on wood chip landscaping and they're also just on pine logs, like way out in the middle of nowhere. So most psilocybin mushrooms, you find them near human disturbance, but this one, you can be like 20 miles from the nearest road or trail and you'll still find them. And then this one is the uh, second most potent psilocybin mushroom in the world, Psilocybe azurescens. So most of you probably pick these, uh, but the season for these is just starting right now. So like a week ago, nobody was finding them, but now um, there's like 10 or 20 people finding them, and in like three or four days, there'll be like 10,000 people finding them. But right at the mouth of the Columbia River is where they're the most common, but they go up and down the coast at a few hundred miles in either direction, actually. Uh, these things are really tall, and they are really potent. They have about two percent psilocybin by weight when they're dry, um, so twice or more than an, an average cube. But really cool looking. I find these out, out in the coastal dune grasses, Long Beach area, and so you go out there and you'll find like all sorts of police with binoculars and they're looking for the hippies in the grass. <laughs> <laughs> they do have to be really careful because they arrest a lot of people for these. And I'm not, like, the drugs are kind of decriminalized a little bit, but they go by weight. So I don't know what the cutoff is, but if you have a, a bunch of wet mushrooms, they're gonna be like, oh, he's a drug dealer, because they weigh a pound, even though it's 99% water. That's how the drug laws are in this country. They're really bad. Uh, anyways, really cool looking things. They have this coordinate partial veil. So these, the veil is like these threads. Another one is Psilocybe elenii. These are coming out too. Um, quite a bit all over here because they're growing wood chip landscaping. They're super strong and when they're fresh they look like this, really kind of spherical. And then when they get old, they get kind of ugly, they look like this. Uh, but much thicker caps and thicker stems than azure essence. Uh, and they're extremely aggressive mycelium. So sometimes um, you'll like throw some spore water down and come back a couple years later and there'll be literally a hundred thousand mushrooms if there's enough food for them. There's an extremely aggressive one. So when I find stuff like this, I take them and spore print them, just put them on tin foil, and then I put another layer of tin foil over the top, leave them overnight, and then take, uh, take it off in the morning, let it dry for a couple minutes, being really careful not to stir up any dust in the room, it's better in front of a flow hood, and then I put them into brand new Ziploc bags and uh, drop them in the mail. Psilocybe cyanescens is the wavy cat. These are uh, free like crazy, uh, it's another one, like last week there were not very, very many, but just today on my Facebook feed is full of massive flushes of these things. So it's like the first flush happening right now. Uh, and then another one that's really cool is Psilocybe pelliculosa. This one grows under a conifer debris. And this one I found 
where was this one at? Port Orchard. This one was in Port Orchard, but they have a really wide dis uh, distribution. They were discovered in Oregon, uh, kind of near Florence, Oregon, and they're found in British Columbia, all the way down uh, into like uh, Central California. And then two years ago, I found them in Arizona. It's the first time this has been found away from the coast, but DNA sequence match. So yeah, they're, they're in Arizona as well. Uh, another really cool one is the Liberty Cap, Solosity Seminaciata. This one is breeding really well right now, all over the grassy areas near the coast. Uh, so people have been posting pictures of these for about two weeks now, and they'll fruit for you know, really good for another few weeks. Uh, but they really like um, just these grassy pastures where animals graze, and they're really potent. Oh, an interesting thing about Solosity Seminaciata is they have a really high amount of theocystin. So that's another trip to me. Something like Psilocybe cubensis has only trace amounts of theocystin, uh, but Psilocybe seminantiana has half as much theocystin as it has psilocybin. And then here's Psilocybe baocystis. So baocystin is named after Psilocybe baocystis, but actually seminantiana has way more baocystin than theocystis does. This one is pretty rare. I found this in somebody's garden in, I think it was Issaquah. Also grows in lawns. And then another one that is really elusive is Psilocybe cyanofibrillosa. And uh, just in the past couple of weeks, there was an update in Psilocybe cyanofibrillosa because I was starting to wonder if it was in a real species and I started to delete it out of my talks. But somebody was able to sequence the holotype of this using Illumina and they found that Psilocybe cyanofibrillosa is a real species and it's a sister species to Psilocybe stutzii and that we don't have any DNA sequences for it. So I've been looking for this for a long time and people are sending me samples and none of the samples that people have sent me have turned out to be this species. So this photo, maybe it's that species, but I don't know because uh, Caleb did not save the sample. So if you find a really interesting psilocybin mushroom, you can eat most of them, you don't eat all of them. I always save at least a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I only need about 10 milligrams for DNA sequencing, so just a very tiny little bit. I can do it with one milligram, uh, but if you eat you know, every last milligram, then we'll never know what they are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this might be Psilocybe sanofibrillosa. Uh, but hopefully this year we'll be able to get some, you know, if you see any Psilocybes that are just kind of like a little bit different, you're not sure what species they are, definitely get good pictures and safe samples. Uh, Psilocybe stutzii is a sister to Psilocybe sanofibrillosa. This one is called a blue ringer because it has a blue ring on the stem. You can almost see it in the photo. And then this one, Psilocybe obliteo cystidiana, is also pretty common in wood chip landscaping around here. And this one is, interestingly, it's really closely related to Psilocybe cubensis. So it's basically a cube that grows on wood chips. And it was discovered in Ohio uh, in like 2003, uh, but it's probably been there a lot longer. And then just this year, it turned up in China, so maybe it has an older name. But Psilocybe ovoidio cystidiana is named because of the ovoid cystidia. So these are the cells you see on the gills that look almost like hot air balloons. And then here is the mycelia of Psilocybe ovoidio cystidiana. So this is just growing in a petri dish. It's a nice rhizomorphic mycelium. And then this one is Psilocybe mescalarolensis. So Psilocybe mescalarolensis was discovered recently in New Mexico. And there are, uh, Psilocybe needs really high humidity, so there's not a lot of Psilocybe habitat in New Mexico. Uh, but this is the holotype location. So this is where Psilocybe mescalarensis was discovered. You can see there's a lot of spruce, a lot of fir, uh, a lot of fog and humidity. And forest fire? Yeah, I guess it had burned before. Uh, but this one is pretty rare. Only a couple people have found it. And the guy who discovered it is named Lee Walstad. Um, very eccentric guy. Uh, another one that's really rare and only grows in the mountaintops of Arizona is Psilocybe hopii. So this is named after the Hopi tribe. 
And this was named by Jonathan Green, who was trying to honor the Native people, but actually they got really upset about it. Uh, another one that's named after the Native people is Salasabi Aztec. And Salasabi Aztec Horn was discovered in the volcanoes that surround Mexico City. So Mexico, uh, Mexico City is like 1,500 meters, but it's surrounded by volcanoes, and the volcanoes are very tall, and they're very cold at the top, and they're covered in mushrooms. And at the top of the volcanoes, there are really interesting psilocybin mushrooms. Um, so Salasabi Aztec was discovered there, and then it's also turned up in a few of the other volcanoes in Mexico. And then more recently, somebody sent me a bluey mushroom from Colorado, and I sequenced it in the little lab in my garage, and it turned out that that one was uh, Psilocybe as the quorum as well. And then we uh, also sequenced Psilocybe Quebec Canada from Quebec, Canada, and that's as the quorum as well. So it turns out that in Mexico, this grows at the top of the mountain, 3,000 meters elevation, and in Colorado, it grows like 2,000 meters elevation, and then in Canada, it grows down by sea level. So a lot of times when I find really cool mushrooms, I'll just throw them on some black velvet and take a picture of them, makes the, all the colors really pop. And then Jim the Pilot's Subspectabilis is huge and all over the East Coast. If you find anything like this in Washington, uh, Jim the Pilot's Ventricosis, and it's not psychoactive, but Jim the Pilot's Luteus and Subspectabilis are the psychoactive Jim the Pilot's from the East. They're both really big both really common, and you can find that logs that have 100 pounds of them on there. And then the most commonly cultivated mushroom is Psilocybe cubensis. And Psilocybe cubensis is named after Cuba. However, it's invasive in North America. It's actually from Asia and Africa. So it came over with the cattle about 500 years ago. And this mushroom is super easy to cultivate, and it's really quick to cultivate. So almost everything in this talk you can grow at home, but the cube, uh, cubes grow faster than anything else, so that's why they are so common on the black market. Uh, just about 100, almost 100% of what's on the black market is Psilocybe cubensis. You know, a lot of different cultivars, this is Enigma, so it never really made accounts of stems, just kind of folds. And then, so I took this enigma and I put it into a frying pan and I cooked it with olive oil and garlic. <laughs> and, uh, and it was really good. They are delicious. Uh, these mushrooms are absolutely wonderful when you cook them up. They're like, well, they would be in every grocery store if they weren't hallucinogenic. <laughs> <laughs> and the psilocybin is also very heat stable, so it's still really, uh, really potent even after like a really high temperature cooking. <laughs> Another really cool one is Psilocybe cerulescens. Uh, so this one is one of the four mushrooms that they call durumbes in Mexico because it grew up landslides. Uh, this one was discovered in Alabama in 1923. And then in the 1950s, it was found all over Mexico. It's also all over Central America, South America, and the Caribbean. But in 1996, Paul Stamets found it in Georgia, and he thought he discovered a new species, so he named it, named it after his friend Andrew Weil. Uh, but it turns out that it's actually what he was finding was the same as Psilocybe cerulescens, so now Andrew Weil does not have a mushroom named after him anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but these are really cool, they're really big. Sometimes they grow in really big clusters. There's a sawmill in Jalisco. When I go there, there's like you can just easily pick a hundred pounds of Psilocybe cerulescens. Uh, because there was like mountains of sawdust and it just like consumes the sawdust and it turns it into mushrooms. And this is a really, uh, typically grows on landslides, so it's really good for microremediation. As in, whenever there is like some kind of ecological devastation, like a landslide or they build a new road, then these are the first mushrooms that you find in that area and it kind of stabilizes the soil and it makes good soil so the plants and everything else uh, can revitalize the area. So when I find uh, like a whole lot of these, what I'll do is I'll pick them and then I'll throw them all over like the, the roads and where places where people are messing with the environment. And it's a form of like a remediation. <laughs> Another really cool one is Psilocybe yungensis. Um, so Psilocybe yungensis is one of the few wood lovers that I find in Southern Mexico. Um, I also see it in Ecuador and other places, but Really beautiful thing, it has a really thin cap, 
and um, I see it all over southern Mexico, so both on the east and the west coast. And then here's a really rare one, Psilocybe hymii. And this one is the only psilocybin, or only psilocybe that has like an orange tone to the gills when it's really young. And it's only been found a few times, but um, usually when I find it, there's just one or two, but one time there was like 30 of them, so I was able to get this picture. And then this is everyone's favorite psilocybe, psilocybe hoopshigenii, because it has this really acute like, umbo at the top of the cap. So this is like, this photo here, um, somebody took the photo and they made this shirt from this photo. So that was really nice of him. Uh, but these shirts are really cool. The guy who makes them, his name is Howell, and he lives in Guadalajara. And he makes the best mushroom shirts. He's got like a dozen different ones and they're all hand drawn. Um, so if you follow Joel Bio, Bio Illustracion in um, Instagram, you can order these shirts and you can get like, um, like everybody, he sells them all at all the Mexican fungus fairs, so all the Mexicans have way better mushroom shirts than we do. <laughs> <laughs> but he does ship to the United States and he's got so many cool ones. Uh, the really rare one, the only one that I haven't photographed in the wild is Psilocybe meridionalis. Um, so this was discovered in 2007 from a mountain called Sierra de Cacoma, which is a remote mountain in Jalisco. And um, I couldn't find it. I went to Sierra de Cacoma a couple times and I couldn't find it, so I went to the herbarium. Um, so in the herbarium, it's like a library for mushrooms, and they save all of the mushrooms forever. And uh, you can see back here it says isotype. So this is part of the original collection of Psilocybe meridionalis. And so at least I was able to photograph it right. Uh, but they have all these boxes, and yeah, opened up the box, and they have all the collection notes in here. And uh, so they have, um, you know, it's all written in Spanish, but one cool thing that they have are the GPS coordinates. Um, so they have the alt altitude and the exact coordinates where they found it. And so I um, saved that in my Google Maps, and I went out there, and this is the spot that they discovered it. Uh, it wasn't there, but I just have to go in a year where there's a lot of rain, and probably it'll be there. <laughs> and then Psilocybe Mexicana is a really popular one. It barely stains blue enough, but it's extremely potent, and it has the strongest smell of any Psilocybe that I've smelled. So it has um, a cucumber smell, but just a really strong cucumber smell. So there's a lot of lookalikes, a lot of little brown mushrooms, but none of them smell anything like this. Do they taste like cucumber? Yeah, they do. <laughs> to me. And then here's Psilocybe mulircula. This is another one of those uh, landslide mushrooms, but this one grows at really high elevation, so on the tops of volcanoes in Mexico. And I was in Mexico like a month ago, and I found some Psilocybe mulircula, and actually made a video of it, so maybe I will try to show you this video. It's not like a good video, it's just with my cell phone, but it's kind of cool to like see these things in habitat. And here's some Psilocybe mulircula that are very young. I'm not focusing that wrong. Here's some Psilocybe silica. <laughs> Here's some Psilocybe mulircula that are very young. And this is definitely going to be edited one day, but I'm terrible at video editing. So I'm just going to show you. They the have like a caramel colored cap, almost copper top when, it's, when it first starts out. So this is really high elevation. This is like the top of the mountain. It's really cold up there. You can see I got my camera, I got my lights. It's a really beautiful place. There's Jordan Jacobs. Um, this was like, a, yeah, this is the Proud Forest. So Veracruz has beautiful habitat. <laughs> awesome habitat. <laughs> what do you have here, Jordan? Mm, here I have some Psilocybes at the Oh, wow. That are in um, a very nice maturity state. Oh, man, those are cool. Um, yeah, so Psilocybes at the is another one of the uh, landslide mushrooms, and Psilocybe zephyrcorum is the world's most potent psilocybin mushroom. So we found the lyrical and zephyrcorum right next to each other. Oh, yeah. um, you can see how big these things are. They're like eight inches tall. Uh, whereas, you know, most of the psilocybin mushrooms in North America are just like little brown mushrooms, but these are much what bigger. What kind of camera is that? This is a Nikon Z5 mirrorless camera. 
mirror of this camera. So you see Jordan's trying to get the best picture he can um, of this Sylvester Bees at the core. Oh, good choice. That looks really sharp. And if we want to watch, he's going to teach us, I guess, a couple photography tricks or something. <laughs> so you got your aperture all the way open here. What has the most contract? So, anyway, that's that one. And then another one that I really like is Psilocybe neohalapensis. Uh, and Psilocybe neohalapensis is another one that grows in cloud forests. Um, only in <clears throat> southeastern Mexico. So this one smells like cucumbers and oil paint, and it um, it's really potent, and it grows way in the middle of nowhere. So like a lot of these uh, psilocybin mushrooms that grow in human disturbance, but this one it grows way out in the cloud forest where no one ever is. Here's what it looks like when it's raining. It's got these beautiful purple gills. And then another one that's really cool is Psilocybe subtropicalis. And this one is closely related to Zapotecorum, but it grows in grassland habitats. And I find this in Veracruz and Oaxaca. And Psilocybe subtropicalis looks really pretty in ultraviolet light. So that's what it looks like in ultraviolet, or the same picture with white light. Uh, but you can see like the gill edges really light up, and that's probably the beta carbolines because uh, the beta carbolines are super fluorescent. And then another one that uh, is kind of cool is Psilocybe campanensis. And if you've read any of the literature on Psilocybe campanensis, it says that it was discovered in the 1970s near Tampa and has not been found since. But actually, since there's more people paying attention to mushrooms, it, it gets found all the time now. So. Uh, I do not have good photos of this one, so I'm using Scott Ostuni's photos, uh, but he's taken some nice pictures of these things. And they're closer related to Psilocybe Mexicana. And they make these nice sclerosia, so if you ever see the Philosopher's Stone, they're usually the species. And then somebody sent me some in the mail from South Carolina, and I sequenced the DNA and it was matched perfectly with the Florida collections. Uh, but this is just the gill edge. So in the gill edge, you have the chylosis video and then the spores. And I use focus stacking to uh, and differential interference contrast to get like a nice sharp microscopic image of all these things. And Psilocybe zapatocorum um, is uh, the strongest psilocybin mushroom in the world that's wild. These can be up to 3% psilocybin when they're dry, so it's one third stronger than Psilocybe azurescens. And they're found in the cloud forests of southern Mexico and Central America and South America. Recently, a lot of people have started growing these. And um, used to think it was really hard to grow. And actually, they're not that hard to grow. You can grow them in monotubs. But um, they just take a lot longer than cubes. Uh, but I think like, as far as uh, the experience goes, this is probably uh, the best psilocybin mushrooms because they're really strong. They don't hurt my stomach like cubes do. Uh, and so I think if people could like just go, but get any psilocybin mushroom in the world, they would probably prefer these. They're definitely my favorite ones to photograph as well because they have that cool stem texture. Um, and they have a taste of cucumber and radish. And they're really strongly bluey. So I just pinched this cap and took this photo like 30 seconds later and it's like nice deep cobalt blue. And then there's also some other mushrooms that have psilocybin that are not psilocybe, like Paniolus. So Paniolus cynescens is, uh, grows in dung. Here's some that I photographed in Jalisco. And whenever I'm out collecting mushrooms, I always put them in a tackle box. So here's some pan cyans in a tackle box, and then everything else that I find also goes in the tackle box. This is a good idea if you're picking mushrooms in a place that it's illegal because uh, that way you can just say you're collecting all the mushrooms and you don't know what they are. And so, um, <laughs> de definitely helps. Uh, here's a photo that I took in my friend's closet, a Paniola Sinus. You can see that they can make really amazing flushes. 
Um, and they're really potent. These things are two or three times more potent than cubensis. And they have jet black spores. So you can see the, the spore print down here. <laughs> So that's about all I have, and I will take questions in a minute, but there's a couple things that I wanted to tell you about. One of them is the uh, Myco Blitz. It's happening, it started on the 13th, and it goes until the 22nd. And the cool thing about what this is, is that anybody in the world, or anybody in North America, can pick mushrooms outside and uh, dry them and send them into the Myco Blitz and get them DNA barcoded for free. So this is how we discover new species and figure out which species we actually have here in, in Washington. And so uh, the person who's doing this is Stephen Russell, and he is really cool. His goal is to sequence 100,000 mushrooms in the next 10 years. And once he does that, he'll be able to figure out how many species we have in North America. So Michael Blitz is happening right now. You can, go, you can all just go out, pick mushrooms, uh, dry them, mail them in. And uh, you can get 10 of these sequenced for free. And so this is really awesome because it used to be like $30 each to sequence them. So you're getting like $300 of DNA sequencing done for free. Um, and so that is really cool. But what's even cooler is what Kyle Cannon is doing. And so Kyle runs the Ohio Mushroom DNA Lab. And he is doing the nanopore sequencing like Stephen Russell. Uh, the difference with the Ohio Mushroom DNA Lab is there's no limit on how many you can pick, so you can just send them your whole herbarium, even if you have thousands of mushrooms. You can also uh, pick them from anywhere in the world, and there's no limitation on dates. So even if you found it 50 years ago, uh, as long as there's an iNaturalist observation, he'll put it through his pipeline and sequence it. And what makes this possible is nanopore sequencing. Uh, so the nanopore is a little DNA sequencer that's very small, it's like the size of a thumb drive. And it used to be that, used to be that you had to like uh, mail the DNA into a lab to do Sanger sequencing, and it was like $10 per sample. But with nanopore, you take thousands of, you take hundreds of mushrooms, like 960 mushrooms, and pool them all together, and then sequence them all at once right on your desktop. So you get the data in 24 hours, right there on your desktop. You don't have to go to any labs or anything. And the equipment to like, get it going costs about $5,000, but once you have the equipment, you can sequence mushrooms for about 30 cents each. Uh, so Kyle just runs on donations and he's able to offer free DNA sequencing to everybody. Um, and then I volunteer for him. I do like well, the sequence uh, processing for him. So I like deliver people the results and go up back in iNaturalist and tell people what it is that they have found. Uh, and that's how I discovered that new species of psilocybin containing inosubi at 1 a.m. last night. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this has like revolutionized the way that we're, do, we're figuring out mushrooms. Um, you know, just in the past couple of years, this DNA barcoding has gotten really inexpensive and really popular. So now we're starting to figure out exactly how many species we have, which are European species, which ones are native to Washington. And you know, we've discovered like hundreds and hundreds of new species of mushrooms uh, doing this. And you know, so if anyone wants to like, discover a new species of mushroom, it's never been easier. Just go outside and pick some mushrooms and mail them in. If you mail in 10 mushrooms, I guarantee at least one of them will be a new species. <laughs> um, and that means that we also really need a lot more people doing taxonomy because it's not too hard to describe a new species of mushroom. You just write a paper, do some microscopic work, do a little bit of sequence analysis, and then you can you know, put a name on these mushrooms, and people have to use that name for the rest of humanity. <laughs> as long as civilization lasts, that, that's the official name. And uh, at least half of the mushrooms in Washington have not been named yet, so there's a lot of work to do, and it's really important work, because if you're trying to like conserve rare mushrooms, you need to be able to give it a name. If you say like, oh yeah, some species grows in this place, but it doesn't have a name, like no one's gonna care. But if, you, yeah, if it actually has a name, and then you say, well, it's only been found in one little spot in the whole world, then you can make a good case that they don't want, they shouldn't preserve this forest, they shouldn't log it anymore, because you know that's the only place in the whole world that mushroom occurs. And you know, every mushroom has thousands, or at least 8,000 chemicals that is naturally in there, and there are really interesting chemicals you know, just like psilocybin is only the tip of the iceberg. 
Um, even Celestia cubensis has a thousand different chemicals in there, and we do not know what most of those chemicals do. So these mushrooms are going extinct at a really rapid rate, so we want to DNA sequence them, get them named, get them into culture, and save them before they go extinct. And uh, with the climate change and everything, the time to do that is really now. So, uh, yeah, definitely collect mushrooms and send them to either Stephen Russell or Kyle Cannon. And that's all I have for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Father. Thank you.